Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to this talk on uh, visualizing the metadata dependencies within your org. I'm Daniel Ballinger. I work for Fuse IT in Nelson, New Zealand. We're an, I <laughs> We're an ISV partner. Um, we also do Sitecore CMS integrations with Salesforce. I've been a Salesforce MVP since 2014, and I'm an active member on the Salesforce Stack Exchange. You can find me on Twitter at Fish of Prey or fishofprey.com, where I'll be posting an extended version of this talk if you want more details about how it goes together. Forward-looking statement is applicable to this talk, so it's important that you make your purchasing decisions based on products and services that are currently available. So we'll be talking about some pilot features, so do bear that in mind. So, what are we going to cover today? First, we're going to look at why you would even look at visualizing the metadata in your org and what benefits we'd hope to achieve from that. Then we'll look at the metadata component dependency API pilot um, and how that's going to help us with our visualizations. Then we'll look at how we can bring it all together to go from data to visualizations. And then we'll do that with uh, three demos that will show the sort of things we can discover through those visualizations. And if we've got time at the end, we'll do a quick Q&A. So why would we visualize the metadata in our org? What are the benefits we hope to achieve over, say, just putting all the data in a table? And I'm going to get there in a very roundabout sort of way by talking about uh, soup and a polar bear. Um, tra and Trailhead DX last year, Wade Wegner termed the coin uh, came up with the term happy soup to describe the way metadata in an org that represents all the functions and the apps all sort of intermingles together. And that's sort of been the status quo for a while now if you exclude uh, packaging 2.0 and unmanaged packages. And then there's all our metadata nicely mixed together in the soup. So where does the polar bear come in? I don't know if any of you recognize that bear. But that was the release logo from 2007, API version 8. That was the release that most of the production orgs I deal with were created around that date. So those orgs are 11 years old, which means the metadata in those orgs is a decade old happy soup. That's uh, 11 years of multiple uh, soup chefs putting in change sets, metadata API deployments, unmanaged packages, there's a whole lot has gone into there. And today, if we were to look at that org, it can be quite difficult to then extract the ingredients that went in and all the dependencies that went between them and how we could reconstruct that org or even potentially take out modular parts of it becomes quite a challenge. And so we want something to help us with those challenges. How would we get individual parts out of that org? Now, we could just load all the data into a large table, but what you'll often find is a large org might consist of thousands of parts of metadata and an equal or more number of edges or dependencies between them, which can make it really difficult to see not just what the relationships are, but the flow-on effects of those relationships. So we need something visual, or we're going to use something visual that will help guide us towards the information we want to find. And we can use the brain's ability to see things like size, shape, proximity, and color to aid us through those visualizations. So we know we want to make a visualization, but we really need to have a goal, otherwise we're just making pretty pictures. So what are some of the things we might do with those visualizations? Well, top, topical at the moment is second generation packaging where we might want to identify potential sub-packages that could be extracted from the org. We might be looking to replace older Visual Force pages with newer Lightning components um, and what areas of the system they will affect. Perhaps simpler but still very important is test code coverage. Are there Apex classes and triggers in our org that are lagging behind and we could identify them as a cluster that need to be updated? Uh, another quite common one is, is there a custom field? If I want to make changes to that field or even delete it, which components am I going to immediately impact from that change? And potentially what flow-on effects will there be from that change? And org shuffles. I might have a very large production org that actually represents the metadata from two or more sub-businesses. 
and it can be quite common to need to divide those up and we'll have a look at the way we split the metadata from those orgs. So we're going to need data to drive these visualizations. And luckily for us, in uh, summer 18, the metadata component dependency API pilot was launched. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried symbol tables, which will give you a similar set of information, but it's really API intensive to run through all the dependencies between the classes. And even then, at the end of the day, you're only going to have the relationships between Apex classes and Apex triggers, and you're not going to have all the other types of metadata, which the metadata component dependency API gives you. So this is uh, it's accessed as a SQL query against the tooling API. So we can do that through the CLI. And what that gives you is a very quick table result, typically. Unless you've got a really large org, you'll get the results back pretty quickly. So these results are showing layout references to custom fields. But what are we actually seeing here? There's four main parts. The blue part is the naming details of the referencing component. So you get the ID, the name, um, and optionally, you can also ask for the namespace. The orange part is the type of the referencing component. And then on the other side, we've got the same details again for the reference component. The green is the ID, the name, optionally namespace. And that sort of really plum color is um, the type of the referenced field. Now, we're going to use this data and turn it into a visualization. So at the simplest level, if we took a single row from there, we're going to transform it into a pair of nodes, one for the referencing component and one for the referenced component. And the edge or the, ref the relationship between them becomes an edge. And that's how we're going to represent it. But we're going to on a much larger scale. Before we get to those visualizations, we want to look at, we want to, it's, it's a pilot feature, that source data. So there are going to be some limitations. This is a subset of what you can and can't currently see. So for example, if you have a custom object, you can tell where it's used in an Apex class. But if you had the same custom object, if it was used in a report, you wouldn't currently be able to tell that through the API. If you want a full list of what is and isn't currently supported, Andy Fawcett has a dependency sample there with the complete table of all, all that it supports currently. Then it's not to say that we're limited to just what that API provides it. We can augment that data with other queries against the tooling API. So for example, if we wanted to know lookup relationship fields, we can use the custom field metadata to find that relationship. Uh, we can also do simpler things like the API version for Apex classes, or even just the number of records on a custom object. And we can merge that into the graph as meta metadata. So how do we bring it all together? Well, the first step, we run the tooling API query against the metadata component dependencies, get all the results back. Then we run through that programmatically and build up a graph of nodes and edges for each named component. And if we want to get a bit fancy, we will do our um, metada metadata and augment it with API version, code coverage, all that sort of data. And then we'll export it ready for the graphing tool to run. In the graphing tool, which we'll get to shortly, we can do things like adjust the way the nodes are laid out, the filters that are applied, how we partition the data. And then to that, we analyze it towards the goals we mentioned earlier, depending on what we were interested in. Now, those first four steps, I have built uh, both a CLI tool and a GUI tool that basically automates them. I'm not actually going to show you them. It's not particularly exciting. You run a command, it makes a file. Um, We'll, we'll look at the more interesting parts. For the graphing, I'm using a third-party tool called Gephi. It's an open source Java uh, application for a visualization of graphs. Uh, it's quite a powerful tool, which we'll soon see. So we'll go into some demos now. Uh, we're going to look at two things initially, obviously Gephi itself, and then field usage and potential packages. So we'll switch over to Gephi here. And the first thing, does anybody recognize what this org is? If it's not completely obvious, that's the Dreamhouse sample app. But really, all you can tell from that is it does indeed look like happy soup. 
So we're going to start doing some manipulations to that graph to see if we can make, get some sense out of it. The first thing we might do, oh, before we get to that, remember our nodes from earlier? Well, this is just a superset of that process. So all the little black dots, those are parts of metadata in the DreamHouse app, and all the lines between them are the dependencies. So now we wanted to try and find something actually useful in the graph. The first thing we might do is partition it or color the nodes based on what type they are. And so what we can see here, we'll get that stable. is there's a large cluster of related green nodes, and the green nodes based on the Kia Apex classes. So there's a large cluster of Apex classes in the DreamHouse app. Now, perhaps we can do something better again. We're going to do a different type of layout. We're going to do what's called a force-directed graph layout, and that looks to group the nodes based on their related edges to keep related things together. And again, we can see our cluster of um, Apex classes up there has separated out. We can also see a large section of lightning components down the bottom, which are areas we could investigate. So that's broken out some of the major areas, but what it's not showing us is what's interesting is happening in the middle there. So we want to try and find out what's going on there. To that, we can run some statistics in Giphy that looks at all the paths, all the edges between the nodes. And we don't need to worry about exactly what it's doing but we can then use a metric that it generates called betweenness centrality. And that's sort of a fancy statistical way of saying, let's size the nodes based on how important they are for the relationships between all the other nodes in the graphs. Because we can see there's this large yellow node that's developed in the middle, which was probably something quite important for the concept of the DreamHouse app. So now we're going to turn on the labels. And it can be a bit overwhelming, but if we zoom in here, this largest, most important app uh, property is, unsurprisingly, the property custom object. It is the thing that's central to the DreamHouse app. Now, we know that the DreamHouse app has a uh, custom field called address, but it's quite hard to find in this uh, dependency sample. So what we can do is we can switch over to the data table view of the graph. There we go. And we can filter to just that field by name. And now we've found it. We can switch back to selecting that in the graph, zoom out a bit. And now we know that, so you can see the pink custom field address in the middle there. And we know if we start to make any changes to that custom field, we're going to need to look at the, there's two Apex classes there. There's an Apex page, a flow. Those are the things that are going to be immediately impacted by any change to that field. Uh, I don't have time to do it, but you can actually use the graph to draw a spider view out from that field to show the flow on effects of what would also happen from that field. The second demo we're going to look at now is um, looking for potential packages within that. So again, we're going to switch over to another uh, statistical analysis, one that's called the modularity report. What that's going to do is it's going to look for clusters of nodes that are strongly related. We don't need to worry exactly how it's doing it, but we're going to color our nodes by the modular classes that it's found. And we can see some quite distinct areas there. Down the bottom left, there's a large blue area. We'll have a look at that. And there's a core node in the middle if we select that and drag it out, where is it? Yeah. So it's our friend Einstein vision. So what we could potentially do is partition those nodes off and turn them into a sub package and use that uh, rather than the, as the whole, as part of the whole. There's another part we can see in the DreamHouse app here at the top, which is where all those Apex classes were. Those are all functions related to running a bot. Um, so we could draw an arbitrary line around those nodes and say, this will be our package. And there's a couple of important things here beyond just saying, this is our package, we're, that's great, we're done. We could export those nodes um, into a CSV for use in generating that package. 
But it's not just the package that's important. It's also its relationship back to the uh, org as a whole. So we need to look at all those edges that cross that package boundary and think about how we're going to integrate it back into the org. So we might need to do some dependency injection or define some common interfaces for that package to connect in with. For our next demo, we're going to look at test code coverage. It's quite an important thing. We'll call this a universal containers app. And what you're looking at here is a filtered list of just the Apex classes. And I've sized those nodes by what's called the degree, which is the number of edges in or out, the number of dependencies in or out of each piece of meta. Uh, sorry, I haven't done that. I've sized those nodes by the length of the Apex class with comments. So the bigger the node, the more Apex they have in them. So you can see there's three core classes there that contain the majority of the Apex. Next, we're going to color those nodes based on the uh, code coverage results from the last test run. And because it's code coverage results, we're going to drag that slider up there, which means at about 75%, the color will start changing from red right through to blue. And so that yellow is sort of borderline coverage. Now, the first disturbing thing in that graph is there is a lot of red nodes there, which means there's a lot of nodes with very poor coverage. But it's not actually the case, because we're looking at test classes as well, and test classes don't have coverage. So we can use a filter down here on the bottom right, and we can say, say just show me the um, Apex cl test classes. And we can apply a distinct gray color to those, so they're a bit easier to distinguish in the graph. And now we can bring them back into the graph as a whole and turn on the labels which say, show me the code coverage percentage. And we can see, like, say, in the case of this uh, node here, we'll make it a bit easier to see, that these are the test classes that contribute to the coverage of that class. And it is actually possible we could fiddle with the labels and you could see exactly what the class names are, but we won't do that at the moment. We can see some other things in the graph here, like this disturbing red node down here. Not only does it have no coverage, but it has no test class referencing it. So that's something we'd probably want to investigate in that org to find out what's going on there. Now, there's other ways we could lay out this graph. We could, and we're going to try a circular layout here, and we're going to firstly apply it just to the um, test classes. I'll just run that. And the first thing we can see is all the test classes have a relationship down to that bottom node there. That's the data factory node in the org, the one that's driving all the test data for all the test cases. What we might do is color that node separately or even take it out of the graph if it's um, interfering with what else we're trying to see. So we'll bring back the other nodes, the non-test class nodes, give them the same circular layout, and we're arranging them in order by percentage covered. And the first disturbing thing we can see here is that there are less test classes than there are core classes, which means we can't be unit testing one-to-one -one on our classes. The other thing we can immediately see is that about a third of our classes don't even make the 75% coverage mark on their own. They're being basically dragged through by the ones with higher coverage. If we go up and look at uh, one of these nodes at the top, we see, yeah, this one's referenced by other outer nodes, so it is used, but it has no coverage. And so it might actually be a um, code that you can't reach anymore in the org, or it could just be defining an interface, so you might have to look at that to figure out what's going on there. There's some other larger nodes here. This was the one we looked at earlier. And with the circular layout, it's a bit easier to see which test classes are applied to it and which standard classes. And then there's another, this is one of the top three by size classes. And you'll notice that no test classes came up, but it still has almost 75% coverage. This one's entirely reliant on integration tests from other classes. And it's really a good candidate for um, having its own dedicated test classes. So what do we cover? We covered why you'd want to visualize your org, the sort of benefits we can get, and all the types of manipulation we can get out of that. We covered the metadata component dependency API, how that's a useful data source as a starting point for these types of visualizations. And we ran through three questions, uh, three examples. Uh, before we do any questions, that bit.ly link should take you to my blog where 
right at this moment, it should have automatically published basically the contents of that talk in a sort of slower, more worked out examples. Um, and later tomorrow, there's another talk which will be using the dependency API around unlock packages. Any questions? Do we have time for questions? <laughs> well, you can come find me after, and I have something to give away if anybody wants to come over. Thank you.